I, I once made a list of the 100 best moments of my life, and when it got to 120, I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> That was Maureen Moss back in 2016 when she was a guest on Living Unconventionally. And if you are new to the show, this is exactly what I want to share with you. Wonderful moments that you will cherish for years, with inspiring people who chase their passion around the globe. My name is Chris Piak, and I'm your host here on Living Unconventionally. Welcome to 2019 and welcome back to Living Unconventionally. For our first show this year, I talked again to Maureen Moss about her inspiring story that led her first to a trip around the world with her children and then to a new career as a travel guide who visited more than 70 countries. Let's hear. Maureen Moss is uh, back on the show after her interview in episode 136 with uh, Brittany. In preparation for our conversation today, Maureen, uh, I listened uh, to uh, your interview with Brittany and there was one quote of you that I really, really loved. And that was, I once made a list of the 100 best moments of my life and when I got to 120, I stopped. <laughs> that sounds like a really awesome life. <laughs> Yes, I know it sounds it sounds a lot like boasting too, but it wasn't about that. It was just when I actually kind of got to thinking about all the moments that I'd had that were really will be embedded in my brain forever, you know, unless I completely lose my mind, which is a different topic. Yeah, you know, and I really do. I go back and I revisit those moments sometimes, maybe when I'm out walking or sitting looking at the sea or something like that. So I I go backwards to those places or to those moments and relive them. So I can't believe how lucky I've been. I really, really don't, I, well, how can I put it? I just think I've been so fantastically lucky to have had all these marvelous experiences. And as I've got older, the more I think about the way that the world seems to be developing into I don't want to sound pessimistic, but it sounds it's like people seem to be withdrawing into their own way of life, not tolerating so much other people's way of life, other people's beliefs. And for me, travel, for me, it seems to be the only way that people can learn to understand one another and to connect with one another. And even if you don't, I mean, I'm fortunate in that I speak lots of different languages because that's always been my hobby and a sheer delight for me learning other languages but even without that just by being in countries and finding out a little bit about their culture i think i've, I've said this before and i'm certainly not the first person to say it that it's very difficult to wish a bomb being dropped on somebody that you're sort of a country where you've actually walked along the streets on people that you've actually met and a culture that you actually understand, even if you don't agree with it. So for me, travel has been the single most important influence for good in, in the world. And I think at the moment, I just really hope that people can continue to travel because for me, it's all about expanding our own perceptions, yeah. our way of being in the world. Yeah, I, I completely uh, agree with you, Maureen. And just when you were talking, I was thinking you in this quote, you talk about your, your best memories. I would bet that when people look back at their life, the memories they value the most are the ones where they connected with people, not where they tried to defend what's theirs, not where they were looking out for themselves and their narrow little self-interest, but the moments when they connected with other people and when they were generous and when when they shared a joy with other people, that's the moments that probably made themselves most happy as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more, Chris. It's the connection that we as human beings, we it, it's there. Um, all you have to do is actually kind of tap into it. I'm not suggesting that it's any kind of 
well, I don't know, maybe it is some kind of a spiritual thing, but there's something that connects us all as a species. I think that's the word I'm looking for. It's like a, at a species level, we're all connected. And we're also connected with the whole planet, with the, with the trees, with the animals, with, with the oceans, everything. Mm-hmm. I've been watching uh, David Attenborough mm-hmm. recently. I only recently started watching him, actually. The, the programs that he's making about um, different species, about different, one, one has just finished on uh, UK television that I've been watching this pro- program here in Spain called Dynasties. And it's, there were only, I think, six episodes, but it was all about species that are clinging on to surviving in a world where their land is being taken, their territory is being taken away from them by mankind. And everybody knows about the orangutans at the moment um, <laughs> with the development of you know, spreading use of palm oil. Yeah. It's like we're doing it to ourselves when we're doing it to other species. Um, completely. I, yeah. I, I absolutely agree with you. And the funny thing is, uh, what, what stroke me, uh, attracted me so much to talk with you again, after I listened uh, to uh, the interview with Brittany, in episode 136 was, I was really curious because you have a, um, you look back at your life very fondly. No? If you find hundred uh, good memories in your life, uh, it means that you, you look very fondly back on your life, uh, even though I'm sure there were hard times. Do you think that your perspective on life on on connecting with, with people was generated through your extensive uh, travels? Or was the extensive traveling the result uh, of your worldview that you look to connect with people? Well, if I take it back to the first time I experienced traveling in a foreign country, if I take it back that far, I would say that it was the travel that sort of opened my heart or yes, yes, why not say that opened my heart to the experience of other countries and other cultures. And actually, Chris, that was to Germany. <laughs> yeah, I, and uh, you fell in love there with a German boy, I heard. Yes, and, and yes, he did. I think I've said this before, but he didn't even know I existed. I don't think he even noticed me. <laughs> you know, it, it was probably the German language, because as we all know, a German is the language of love. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, tell us a little bit uh, how um, who you are and how you got into, into this... Uh, amazing lifestyle of traveling all over the world well it was it began very gradually i was taken on holiday not long after that fabulous trip to germany which was a school trip um i was taken uh, on a couple of cruises with my mum and dad because they were the generation that liked to go cruising and we went to the middle east And we went to the Greek islands and I just realized how beautiful some places were. Going to Ephesus opened my interest for, you know, going to ancient sites and learning about other civilizations through visiting ancient sites. At school, I really wasn't really interested in very much until I went on that trip to Germany when I then decided that the If I did languages, that might help me get to travel some more. So it was only really when I went traveling with my mum and dad, albeit on a cruise where you're only going maybe for a couple of days at the most in some of the countries. But even that was enough to, you know, have me interested in history, have me interested in, in geography too, you know, the different types of landscape. And yes, it just really opened up. So I think that connection with other humans came through travel but it was consolidated really when I started doing um, as an adult and that was only the first time I started in 2005 doing um, a program of of ontological education if you want to call it about being about how we are in the world and that really opened me up as well to the idea of us all being connected and even though I had felt that connection myself in various different places, actually studying being as a concept, you know, how we are rather than what we do. That made me 
open to acceptance, I think, is the main thing. I think actually my ex-husband once said that he decided as a result of doing this education that love was about acceptance. I think I agree with him that, you know, when you study other cultures and other ways, people's way of being, and you're able to accept them at the same time, it opens up so much possibility for humanity, I think. And I know I'm told now that I'm just uh, <laughs> way out of touch with the real world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I still believe that. Um, yeah, you know, uh, just let me... Um mention one thing about that. Uh, I love it when people go about this, oh, you know, all this connection stuff, you know, you're so out of touch with the real world. Mm -hmm. um, I have been an entrepreneur all my life, nearly 30 years in business now. Never ever in my own career or in the companies that I worked with uh, or any, any of the hundreds of other entrepreneurs that I know, has anyone ever been paid for being selfish and for dealing in their own interest only. The only way how you get paid in this world is if you help other people solve their problems. Mm. And so who is really unrealistic? The person who goes around the world and thinks, I have to think about myself, my own interest, I come first. Mm. Uh, or the person who goes out and thinks, hey, what is important to you? Why do you care so much? How can I help you? And then sell you something. <laughs> in, in my case, I'm very unromantic in these things, you know, but uh, the, the, the reality is uh, if you are a realist, if you really live in this world, then you can't survive without helping each other and without connecting to other people. And now in the internet age where the whole world is connected, this is even more true than before. I completely agree with you, yes. And my dad was a very, very good salesman. He was like a a top sales manager for the company that he worked with. And um, I remember him telling me that the secret, and my brother actually followed in his footsteps too, because he also became very, very good at, um, you know, very successful at selling. Because in my world, somehow or other, somewhere along the line, selling was something that, oh, you don't do that. That's not, you know, not very nice. But both my father and subsequently my brother said, so it's, it's about, um, giving people something that they need, something that they want. And they may not know they want it or that they need it until you introduce it to them. And that's all it is. Yeah. It's, you know, people have something that they want to fulfill and you can help them to fulfill it by introducing them to whatever it is. It might be an education. It might be a product, it, you know, whatever. Yeah. And it doesn't start by thinking, oh, this is what I have and I want to, to sell it to someone. It starts by uh, talking to the people that you want to serve and finding out, hey, what is it that you need? Exactly. By, by listening and being open. And that's, Chris, that's why I first started to write my tour guide course. Because I really got how I stumbled into that job by sheer good luck good fortune. And there must be so many people who would love to have the opportunity to travel and to be able to, you know, get either get paid to travel or even not have to pay for the travel, you know, or both preferably. Yeah. Mm. And being a tour guide is a way that you can do that. But obviously, tour companies, they're not just going to give the job to anybody who might completely sabotage the tour or who might make so many mistakes that people end up in danger or whatever. Yeah. So um, at the time that I did my course, I, I, as far as I knew at the time, there was only one other person in the USA who was training tour guides. And mine was the first course that came up available online mm -hmm. with the help of a marvelous chap. Chap, that's a very British word. Isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I've got a very posh accent, and it's sometimes no, it's, I, it's, it's lovely. I it's, it's really lovely. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we will talk about your your tour guide uh, course uh, in more detail a little bit later in the second episode. Mm -hmm. 
because I had a look at it and I, I, I actually really loved it. Uh, I, it's presented very professional, very understandable, very straightforward. And um, so we will have a chance to talk about it in more detail uh, in, in the second episode. But uh, first, you know, to take our listeners with us who haven't yet really uh, met you, you have been working as a tour guide, but that didn't happen all at once. How did this come to be that you traveled to more than 70 countries? It was last time uh, you spoke with Brittany. Yes, yes, that's right. And I think it's, had, it's, it's obviously gone up by another three or four since then. <laughs> but I, it started off, I think, when I worked as a teacher in a secondary school. And because I was a languages teacher, and at the time I lived on a very small island called Guernsey in the English Channel between England and France. It, it's a fabulous place. And I just wanted to give the children I was teaching the opportunity to see another world. And certainly not everybody who lives there stays on the island forever and never leaves. But there are quite a high proportion, or there were then, of school children who hadn't left the island and certainly hadn't been anywhere really other than either England or to Saint-Malo in France, which is the nearest place that you could get to from the island. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, I, I, as a languages teacher, I wanted to take my students to Spain, France and Germany because those were the languages that I was teaching. So it started off organising school trips, really. What gave me a kickstart was the fact that I was offered by a colleague in my, one of my very first jobs to be a deputy leader on a ski trip. So I got, I picked up from her a lot of the things that you need to know to organise a trip. And then, yes, as I say, for a few years, then I was doing, leading school trips. How did it happen that you actually became a, a tour guide? What was the, the, the switching moment? The, the moment where you, where you said, okay, okay, now I jump into this. Because I, I believe that a lot of us, we, we, we dream about living a life where we can travel and see the world. But it's a dream. At some point, you, you need to really actually jump into the cold water and swim. What happened in your life that you said, OK, now this is what I'm doing? Well, I was, again, lots of good luck, very lucky. One of the things that happened was that um, my, my um, marriage broke up. And after the initial breakup, I had bought my uh, I bought out my ex-husband's part share of the house and after a couple of years of living there with my grown-up children I decided that I had I, I still was struggling to make ends meet I was teaching in a school full-time I was working teaching business languages in the local finance industry and I had lots of lodgers in the house. I make a joke about, you know, it was a, it was a big three-story Victorian house. And um, if you opened a cupboard, a lodger would fall out, more or less. I'm <laughs> sort of letting as many rooms as I could to try and make ends meet, to try and, you know, pay off the mortgage. Obviously, it was a higher mortgage than when it was only half of it that I had to pay. So, um, and then I just somehow just, I went to a wedding, actually, in England. Um, a colleague got married and I went and I, I stayed with the bridesmaid, the, the, the chief bridesmaid. And we were walking back from the wedding reception and looked up at the sky and there was a new moon. And she had told me that she had just come back from India. And she was describing India and her house was full of very exotic Indian souvenirs. She looked up at them and she said, oh, there's a new moon and all important decisions should be made on a new moon. And I looked up and I thought, I'm going to go to India. I'm going to, I'm going to travel. In fact, I'm going to travel the world. I went back home and I decided after obviously a little bit of thought, not a lot, I have to say, that I would sell the house. The, children, the two older children had moved out anyway and were living in apartments or flats as we called them then, with their friends. My younger daughter was half the week with me and half the week with her dad. And, well, the lodgers would have just have to find somewhere else to stay. <laughs> so <laughs> I sold the family house. I quit my job. And I was getting fed up of teaching anyway because it's you had less and less time to plan lessons and teach. And you were spending more and more time ticking boxes to say what, what targets you'd achieved. 
And so I um, made that decision and we, I, t- I took the children off on a year long round the world adventure. I was going to go on my own. And then I thought, you know, it would be so good for them to, you know, to just see the world. So off we went. Your kids must have gone uh, nuts when they heard the news or not. Yeah, they were thrilled. The two older ones were thrilled. My my youngest daughter, her dad really, and I think he was wise, although I still wish I had taken her, but the the, 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 the decision was that she would stay with her dad and come out to us in the long school holidays, in the Easter holidays and the summer holidays, mm-hmm. wherever we were. And it happened that we were in Australia the first time in Easter, and then we were in um, LA, in California, and Mexico the second time. So she got to see other places as well, which was great. So long story short, when I came back, or when we all came back together, I wanted to retrain in the travel industry. I didn't want to be a teacher again. So I first of all worked for an airline, a local airline, and learned how to do ticketing. But that it wasn't it wasn't for me really and then secondly i went and worked as a travel agent i learned how to be a travel agent and did a couple of you know travel agency qualifications but one day i saw a magazine in the agency called wanderlust and in wanderlust magazine which is a most fabulous travel magazine in existence i now have every single copy that's ever been published It, there was an uh, there was an advert for um, a, a job as a tour leader for a company called the Adventure. It was actually called Travel Bag Adventures at the time, and I just suddenly it came to me that's my job, that's what I want to do. And so I wrote off a letter of application, and um, a week or not long later, actually about a week, I got a phone call. And I think I told this story to Bethany, and I don't know if you want to hear it again, but. Always. Yeah. Good stories uh, you can retell all the time. <laughs> T- take it from me. My children hear my, hear my stories all the time again and again. <laughs> well, I, was, I, I received a phone call and a voice, a male voice, just said my name, uh, Maureen Moss. And I said, yes. So then he launched into Spanish, French, German, and even a few questions in Russian and asked me about He asked, he interviewed me basically in those languages. And after half an hour of absolutely sort of, you know, feeling really pushed to, you know, to perform in my mind, I had to, you know, do this well. Um, he said, oh, right. So we, we know that you can deliver on the languages and we now need to get to know you a bit better. And why he did that was that he said that um, a lot of people say they can speak. French or German or whatever, but actually when they're pushed, when, you know, when it comes to actually being practical and doing it on the spot with no warning, that they sometimes are not quite so good. This is what he said. So he wanted to test me, really, to see how I reacted. And then some weeks later, we met in London, because obviously I was still in Guernsey at that time. He interviewed me in English this time. <laughs> And he did, a bit like we were talking about earlier on, those um, performance-based questions. He gave me scenarios and he said, so you're, I don't know, say halfway up a mountain and one of your, mem- one of the members of your group falls and breaks a leg, what are you going to do? And he ran through about half a dozen of these. The, the bit that really sticks in my mind, and I, I don't know how many times I've repeated this, so I'm uh, Give me if you've all heard it before. But the last question that he set up was um, that I was in a country, I think it was Colombia, it was somewhere that was perhaps a little bit dangerous at that time. I had two middle aged women in the group who did not turn up on time for most of the departures. And that meant, of course, that people were arriving late at destinations and missing out sometimes on a couple of the things that they were supposed to see. Now, that didn't happen, but that's what could have happened if I, as the in the scenario, as the tour guide, had not done something to make sure that they got there on time. Anyway, it turned out that the, the, the scenario 
was that after trying various different things, searching the police station, searching the hospital, looking to places where these two women might have disappeared, he said, right, they're still not in time now. You've kept the group waiting an hour while you've gone off to look for them, and etc. Now what are you going to do? And I just thought, I'm going to leave them behind. And he, he, then I could nearly wrang his neck. He sort of sat back in his chair and looked at me with this sort of stony expression and said, are you familiar with the Sun newspaper, Maureen? And the Sun newspaper is, or yes, I think it still exists, is a sort of um, sensational, you know, broach, uh, whatever you call the, the small newspapers, you know, the, the, the um, everybody Yellow press. It was famous for its page three pictures of naked ladies and stuff like that. So, um, and then he sat back and he put his hands up and mind, travel bag adventures, tour leader, abandons middle-aged ladies in a Colombian village. And he looked at me again and said, are you sure you would leave them behind? And I had no idea what to say. I thought I've lost this job anyway. So I just said, Yes, I've done everything I can think of. The group have already been kept waiting an hour. And yes, I'd leave them behind. And at that point, I was almost prepared to just pick up my bag and, and go, thinking, well, I've lost that job anyway, so I may as well abandon, you know, in, in theory, abandon these women. And he shook my hand and said, congratulations, that's the right answer. You've got the job. And I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it's not a job because I'm going to leave people behind. And he said, our obligation is to deliver the itinerary that these people have paid for. The rest of the group, ha you have to deliver the program that the rest of the group have paid for. And I suddenly got it. And I just thought, oh, yeah. And I realized I can do this job. That makes sense. My answer was actually an instinctual one it, or instinctive one. It was, it was not thought out very well. But actually, when I reflected on it, that idea that my responsibility is to the group as a whole stayed with me throughout the rest of my, my tour guiding career. So that's how I got a proper job as a tour guide rather than being a school tour leader or taking groups of family and friends on holidays and stuff like that. You know, now, now I'm curious because um, obviously after that you went on to actually work as a tour guide. Did you ever experience a situation that was um, as difficult or as scary uh, as this theoretical uh, situation that he gave you in the, inter in the interview? No, not anything that was as potentially disastrous as that. Well, I don't suppose it was potentially disastrous, actually, was it really? They would have been left behind. What, what could have happened to them that I suppose could have ended up badly? But um, they, there were things to do with like a landslide in China. And, and, you know, how do we dig the little minibus that we were in? Uh, this Chinese driver was sort of standing there, scratching his head, smoking his cigarette. And we were all trying to figure out how we were going to get this the, the minibus out of um, mud that was sort of probably about mm, six or seven inches. You know, the tires had sunk down into the mud. And there was rubble all over the road where the landslide had cut had cut the road off, basically. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a challenge. So what did you do? Oh, well, someone, I don't think it was me, to be honest, but someone thought, what, what if we set up, uh, we'd, we'd, buy, we'd bring over a whole load of the big stones um, from the landslide and find something like, I think we've managed to find some planks from somewhere, And um, this probably was one of the more practical members of the group said we need to set up something that the driver can reverse onto. That's, you know, so we needed to, I don't know what you call it. Is it get some purchase on the wheels or something so that... Yeah, that you had some, some grit. Yes, get some grit underneath it rather than mud so that the wheels had something to grip onto. And then we sort of, the driver reversed out of the situation and maneuvered incredibly cleverly out of this narrow road and, and turned around and headed off back down the road. So that was that was a challenge. And, you know, I must be honest and say I didn't think of that solution. But 
you're never completely alone. I mean, you're with a group of people and they can't take responsibility for your decisions, obviously. But if they've got an expertise or they've got a practical skill and can come up with some suggestions, it doesn't make sense not to, you know, take their advice, really. So, yeah. I mean, and that's something that I experienced in, in my life as well, that uh, most things or nearly all things uh, don't turn out as badly as we imagine them. Mm. And uh, when you are in this situation, you also find a solution if you keep your head clear. So, Yeah. Yeah, there was absolutely no choice there. This was before the days of mobile telephones. We were in the mountains. You know, the if somebody had a practical solution, so yes, what else would you do? Yeah. Didn't sit, there was no other bus going to come along and pick us all up with a landslide in the road. So, Great, great. Um, do you have a memory or what is the memory from your time as a travel guide that you cherish the most? Oh, there are two or three actually, but the ones that I cherish the most are the ones where somebody in the group achieves something that they've dreamed of And they hadn't, up to that point, they never thought they'd be able to achieve it. There was um, a lady doctor who was uh, working on one of the remote Scottish islands, and she came on a trip to China, China with her daughter, who was in her early teens. She was probably 13 or 14. And when we were walking along the Great Wall, a lot of parts of the Great Wall, there were lots of high, you know, steps going up to the towers, And we were sitting on the steps halfway down and she was crying. And I said, oh, gosh, you know, what is it? And she just said, I'm so happy. I'm, I've always dreamed of seeing the Great Wall of China and, and now I'm walking on it. And I never forget that. She was she said, I'll cherish this memory for the rest of my life. And then there was another one where there was a lady in our group who was a cleaner in a London hospital. And she had saved her money, it was something like seven years or something she'd saved up. And she hadn't been able to afford what we call proper, sensible hiking clothes. She, she was wearing nylon things, which, as you know, you know, they're cheap, but they're also, they also make you perspire. They make you feel very sweaty. Mm -hmm. And she was wearing these, these type of clothes. And we were in Brazil, and it was the last night of the, of the tour. And one of the things I used to do is uh, there was a mountain in, um, in an area called the Chapada Diamantina, which is inland from a town called Salvador do Bahia. We, we'd been on a hike in the area where there were lots of beautiful waterfalls and lovely um, pale blue and pink and turquoise colored sand. And the sunset from the top of one of the mountains there was stunning. I, I'd been there before and I tried to get every single group to to go up on the last night and take a can of beer up to the top and, um, you know, do a hike. I think it was about an hour or something to get to the top and watch the sunset. And this lady said, oh, no, I'll have to I'll have to sit down um, and I'll stay down in the bus because I won't make it up there. She was a bit overweight. And so long story short, I put her arms around my waist and I pulled her up the mountain. I said, you put your feet where my feet are. I said, I'm going to get you to that mountain. You're going to see. And of course, once she got to the top, it was just so moving and so emotional. Everybody, all the rest of the group were clapping her and, you know, and she was that lovely expression blown away. And, and the other things, other things, but those particular two, I think now, in the moment those are the two that come to mind and i still talking about it my stomach still kind of trembles with it with the thrill of seeing these people mm -hmm. achieve something they just maybe never even thought possible or had dreamed of and didn't realize how they would ever get to do it i can imagine that that's one of the most rewarding things about being a travel guide oh absolutely as far as i'm concerned it is It's more rewarding than the fact that you get to see countries and, and meet people. It's more rewarding that it's that what you were saying earlier on, the connection with other people, that feeling that you have facilitated. They've done it, of course, but you you shared it with them. And in some cases, 
like with the lady going up the mountain. I made that happen for her. And I mean, it almost brings tears to my eyes. Just, I can picture her face now. And it was wonderful. That's what humanity, that's what life's all about for me. The best moments of life. I agree. That was wonderful. If you would like to hear more from Maureen, then um, come back to Living Unconventionally next week because Maureen will be back again with the second part of our interview. And there we talk about how you could become a travel guide. Just like her, uh, Maureen will take us through all the ins and outs about the reality of the daily work as a travel guide, how you find a job, what you need to know to be really good at sharing the wonders of the world with an audience of 10, 20 people who travel together with you and also with the hard times that might be upon you as a travel guide. It's a really, really insightful conversation. I can't wait for you to hear it. So be sure to listen in to Living Unconventionally next week again. Best way is if you subscribe to this podcast right now here, wherever you listen to it. And The second way how you can get in touch with Maureen is through her website. Go to travelguidecourse.com. That's travelguidecourse.com. And there you can get in direct touch with Maureen Moss if you like to know more about how to become a travel guide yourself. My name is Chris Piak. I'm the host of Living Unconventionally. I hope you enjoyed this show as much as I did. And I hope you listen to me again next week in the next episode of Living Unconventionally. If you like, join our community of like-minded globetrotters at livingunconventionally.com slash Facebook. Thank you.